Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, we're getting ready for the speech from Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell. He's already been touring the morning news programmes today and speaking about Labour's plans for nationalisation. He told the Today programme which industries he would prioritise to bring back into public ownership. We're bringing rail back into public ownership as those, um, as those franchises drop. We're looking at water because of the way in which, well, to be frank, consumers have been exploited. And we're looking at building an alternative energy system as well. And we're looking at rail Which would mail. be first? My own priorities. My own priorities are rail, water and energy construction in that way and Royal Mail that will follow. But it depends, again, this is... This is the whole point of our conference this year, is that we're listening to our members and saying, what are your priorities? Because when we go into the next election, that manifesto has to be radicalised and refined and the priorities have to be spent out. John McDonnell in the broadcasting studios a little earlier. Well, I'm joined now by the director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, Paul Johnson, who's going to stay with me throughout the speech by the Shadow Chancellor. Now, let's sort of turn the clock back a little bit. At the time of the manifesto, the Labour Party manifesto, you said the figures didn't really add up. These are the figures that they were going to raise in taxes in order to fund their spending commitments. Is that still your position? Well, the big picture is that there were a lot of spending increases in the election manifesto and some very big tax increases and the Labour Party said quite explicitly that they were happy to borrow quite a lot more than the current government is happy to do. But even beyond that, because what they were trying to do was get £50 billion of additional tax revenue, all from companies and very rich individuals, it was pretty clear that they couldn't actually achieve that level of tax increase from that narrower tax base. Right, and we were talking there about £48 billion that they were hoping to be able to raise to fund some of their spending commitments. Now, we have heard from the Shadow Chancellor saying that actually he'd like Labour to be even more radical. In terms of the public finances, what would that look like to you? Well, it depends what you mean by radical, but, well, let's, be, but let's be clear. I mean, what we saw in Labour's manifesto earlier this year was the most dramatic change in fiscal policy that we will have seen in well, at least since 1979 and probably for some considerable time before that. It would have taken the British state to a size we haven't seen since the 1970s, both in terms of tax and in terms of spending. Now, that's perfectly plausible, in a sense, because a number of European countries do that, but it really would be a very big change. Right, because you're saying the size of the state would be increasingly and, and quite obviously larger than it has been for a very long piece of... Long, sorry, a long time. But when you look at the politics of today, for instance, breaching the public sector pay cap, for example, the Tories have moved on to Labour agenda. So are they setting, if you like, uh, the pace for politics going forward and a bigger state? Well, on the, on the pay cap, it's, I mean, we've, pro we've clearly politically reached a point at which it's hard to keep it, but actually economically we've reached the point where it probably makes sense to start giving public sector workers a bit more than that 1% because their pay is now back to where it was actually in 2008, before the crisis, relative to pay in the private sector. So we've got to that point where that's going to be pressure on that anyway. For, for, for other things, we've got big pressures coming down the road where we are at the moment is a state the same size as it was uh, just before the crisis. So all of that austerity, all it's done is get us to where we were after nine years or 11 years actually of Labour government. But down the road we're going to be spending more on pensions and more on health because of the change in the size and the age of the population. And that will require, just to keep things as they are, that will require more tax and more spending unless there's scope for additional spending cuts elsewhere, which is looking very difficult at the moment. Right, just dipping into the hall, we can see Dennis Skinner taking his seat. I think he was the warm-up man there. There was a standing ovation for the veteran left-wing MP. Um, Dennis Skinner, always been a thorn in the side of the government and some uh, Labour governments too in the past. One of the areas that John McDonnell is supposed to talk a little more widely about is renationalising key industries. How would that work? Well, in terms of the public finances, the headline figures would look bad because that's a, a cost in the short run. Um, in, in reality, if you're paying uh, something, you're spending on a, an asset like the railways or, uh, or, or like the energy sector or whatever it is that you want to rationalise, if you're paying what it's worth, then it doesn't really change the public sector balance sheet. So the issue 
is less about the costs and more about where are these things best managed. Are they best managed in the private sector with the regulation that they have at the moment, or are they best managed in the public sector? And lots of these industries are in the public sector in other countries, but don't forget when they were in the public sector in the UK, many of them really didn't work terribly well. One of the arguments that's been put forward by Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell is in order to carry out some of the policies they'd like to do on renationalising the railways, having state aid maybe for some ailing industries as they see it, that wouldn't be in line with EU rules. Is that the case? Well, certainly state aid, state aids are not in line with uh, European rules, and there are good reasons for that. That's to do with having a fair uh, playing field in terms of competition, and actually you'd find it difficult to do that uh, with free trade agreements with a lot of other countries as well. You need to have something approaching a level, a level playing field, otherwise other countries aren't going to want to trade with you. They're not going to want to take your goods if you're subsidising them and therefore undercutting their domestic industry. So if we're to play on the world stage as a trading nation, as we must, then we're going to have to take some notice of these kinds of rules. And actually these state aid rules have effectively constrained British governments for doing things which in the long run can be quite damaging. Right, we're expecting um, John McDonnell to take to the stage. In fact, he may be on his way there now. If we can go into the hall and see if the Shadow Chancellor is ready. Well, there's Jeremy Corbyn. They're standing up and probably clapping him in now. There he is. Let's go inside the conference hall and listen to the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell. In a shorter time, the chair will sort me out if we're not careful. That film was made by Ken Loach, the director. I want to thank Ken. Here he is. I want to thank him for his life of dedication to social justice. Thank you, sir. There are... There are some unsung heroes I want to thank as well, and it's the Shadow Treasury team that have worked so hard over the last couple of years to make sure that we had a costed manifesto and make sure we're taking it to the Tories. And that's Peter Dowd as our Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Jonathan Reynolds, Annalise Dodds, and in the Lords, Dennis Tunnicliffe and Brian Davis. I want to say thanks to them for their hard work. <laughs> you know, I now have a brilliant, brilliant parliamentary private secretary. Her name is Karen Lee. She won Lincoln back to us at the just general, last general election. Thanks, Karen. This is, a, this is a woman who wins the election, comes to parliament, takes her seat as an MP. She's a nurse, realizes they might be short at the local hospital, so goes back and does her shifts at the hospital. That's what I call the socialist. <laughs> only, only a few months ago, we were 24 points behind in the polls. Our opponents and virtually every political commentator, and those expressions are actually interchangeable, by the way, <laughs> they, they predicted that we be wiped out in the general election. I said then, in interview after interview, that the polls would narrow and we would shock them all. Not many believed me. Some wondered what I was on. <laughs> but let's be honest. Until you saw the exit polls, you were a bit edgy as well, weren't you? <laughs> What I said then is before the election was once we entered the election period and broadcasters were legally obliged to give us some semblance of balanced coverage, we'd turn the polls round. Why? Why did I think that? Well, first, because people would be given the chance to see Jeremy Corbyn for what he is, what I know he is the honest, principled, and yes, strong and determined person and leader that he really is. And second, because people would see in our manifesto what we really stood for and our vision of hope for our country. And you know, that's what's happened. But it's also down to you, our members. 
whose overwhelming enthusiasm inspired people in their millions to come out and vote for us. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for what you did. Thank you. So yes, we've proved now that we're an effective campaigning party. We now have to prove that we'll be an effective governing party. A government that can set the political agenda for a generation. That's our objective. And you know, if you study history, the history of our party, you'll see it's always been the role of Labour governments to lead our country into each new era. It was the Labour, the Attlee Labour government, that built a new society from the debris of the bomb sites in the new era after the Second World War. Those men and women who had endured so much through the depression of the 1930s and who had sacrificed so much to defeat fascism placed their trust in us, in our party. My dad was a sergeant in the army and my mum was a welder by day in a munitions factory and an ARP warden at night. God knows how she did it. But they came out of the war with that spirit of 1945 inspired in them by the election of a Labour government. And the Labour Party fulfilled its promise. They fulfilled its promise to them and all families by creating the welfare state, providing free education for their children, building a decent home, investing in the economy based upon full employment, and yes, creating that jewel in our crown, the NHS, the most civilising act of any government ever. And in, and in the 1960s, when the Tories governed this country from their gentlemen's clubs on behalf of the privileged few and held this country back from facing the challenges of the modern era, it was the Wilson Labour government that recognised the potential of a modern Britain forged, as Harold Wilson said, in the white heat of the scientific revolution. For my brother and me, and so many others of our generation, new educational opportunities enabled us to challenge the barriers that held back so many working class kids. It was down to a Labour government. And yes, and yes, in 1997, I remember it, after 18 years of Thatcherism, when whole industries and communities have been destroyed by the Tories, and when our public services were on their knees, it was the Blair Brown governments that recognised and delivered the scale of public investment that a 21st century needed. We should, do you know, we should never forget that we are part of a great Labour tradition, and we should be so proud of that. So as we now enter the new era, the next era, the era of the fourth industrial revolution, I tell you, it's a Corbyn Labour government that will rescue our country from austerity. And it will be up to us to lay the foundations of that new world that now awaits us. That new world is being shaped already by the beginnings of the fourth industrial revolution. Huge changes are underway in our society and in our economy. Technological change is accelerating. This year, Chinese scientists use quantum mechanics to teleport data to a satellite. We can, we've beaten that. We can match that. We've beaten it. We have a whole Tory government teleported from the 18th century. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're determined that Britain embraces the possibilities of technological change. Scary though that might be. By the middle of this century, it's possible that up to half of the jobs we now do could be automated away. The jobs that remain can, if we let them, be exploitative, dangerous, degrading, and dead end. Or the jobs we create can provide good, secure employment in work that's fulfilling and meaningful in communities where pride and prosperity has been restored. We've already a foretaste of what this revolution would look like if it was left to the Tories. It's being used to vastly enrich a tiny elite whilst creating life for many workers of, well, you know, long hours, low pay, 
and insecure unemployment. So there's a choice to be made. We can remain a low-wage economy, specialising in zero-hour contracts, or we can use the state to help shape Britain's future in this new world. We know it can be done. You know, as the Tories waste time and energy alienating our closest trading partners, other countries are using state direction of innovation and investment to carve out vital areas of expertise in robotics, in electronic cars, in clean tech, in the smart city. But though the technologies are new, the British problem is old. The city is not channeling investment into high value, high productivity businesses. Instead, it's channeling investment into property speculation, often owned by overseas speculators. It's, it's the rentier economy, where wealth is secured not by what you produce, but the amount of rent you can charge. So we'll change that. We'll put taxpayers' money into key research projects. We'll foster the creation of networks and clusters of expertise. We say to the technology sector and the universities, help is on the way. So to reconnect, to reconnect, to reconnect the financial sector to the economy of research and development and production, we'll transform our financial system. Labour will establish a strategic investment board comprising the Chancellor, Becky Long-Bailey, the Secretary of State for Business, the, <laughs> okay. what, one of the stars of our new generation, and we'll also include the Governor of the Bank of England to coordinate the promotion of investment and employment and real wages. But in our investment strategy, let's make it clear, we will no longer accept the disparities between investment in London, the home counties, and the rest of the country. We, this Tory government plans to invest in the north just one-fifth of what it will spend on transport per head in London. We'll legislate for a fair distribution of investment. We'll, We'll devolve decision-making through regional development banks, our mayors, and regenerate the powers and resources available again to local government and our local councils. We'll, we'll build Crossrail for the North, connecting the great northern cities from west coast to east, and yes, we'll extend HS2 into Scotland and invest in rail all across the country overall. We'll deliver the funding for Midlands Connect, overhauling transport across the Midlands. And we'll overturn decades of neglect and lack of investment in the South West by electrifying. <laughs> we'll, I tell you, at long last, we'll electrify the railway lines from Cornwall right through to London once and for all. You know, the storms and flooding in recent months are yet another environmental wake-up call. This country has huge natural renewable resources, and we have immense, an immense heritage of scientific and engineering experience. Yet this government has slashed the funding to the renewables industry that needs to get on its feet. We'll ensure we become world leaders in decarbonizing our economy. And we'll, and we'll do it partly through a publicly owned energy supply based upon alternative energy sources. Where the Tories have dithered and delayed to deliver zero carbon electricity, we'll absolutely commit for example, to building projects like the Swansea Tidal Lagoon.
Minister. Ras will only become an economy for the many if we significantly broaden ownership. That means, yes, supporting entrepreneurs, small businesses, the genuinely self-employed, and massively expanding worker control and the cooperative sector on a scale we've never seen before in this country. You know, building an economy for the many also means bringing ownership and control of the utilities and key services into the hands of the people who use them and work in them. So yes, I want people to have no doubt. Rail, water, energy, Royal Mail, we're taking them back. We cannot, we can't allow this dynamic vision for our economy to be undermined by the combination of, well, belligerence and incompetence displayed by the Tories in the current EU negotiations. Our aim, yes, is to create a Britain for the many, not the few. But our conscience doesn't end at the English Channel. We want a Europe for the many, not the few. That's why... That's why, yes, whilst respecting the referendum decision, we'll work with our partners across Europe to create a European future based upon collaboration and cooperation. But I tell you, we start with the first step. We start with addressing the brutal treatment of EU citizens by this government. We demand. We demand that the rights of EU citizens in this country are fully protected, just as we wish the rights of UK citizens in other EU countries to be protected as well. And I I want to warn the Tories, I want to warn them. If they try to water down or undermine the protections we've secured on employment, consumer or environmental rights, we'll give them the political battle of their lives. As, as we go into government, you know, we'll have to clear up the mess the Tories have left us. And after long years of austerity, the Tories are leaving a society steeped in debt and scarred by low pay and insecurity. With our public services, well, we've heard, in meltdown. Well, we will commission a review of the scale and causes and responses to debt, that's true, but action is needed fast. So first, what we'll do is that what the Tories have failed to do. We in government will bring down the government's deficit and will take and control the debt. The Tories have borrowed, let's be clear, the Tories have borrowed more than any Labour government ever. <laughs> on, on arrival in office, we'll set out plans to eliminate the deficit and reduce the debt based upon our fiscal credibility rule. For each policy in our manifesto, we're preparing detailed implementation plans. But to pay for those public services, let's just be straight with people. To pay for those public services, we'll close the tax loopholes and the tax avoidance scams by the mega rich. And And we're not asking for the earth. We simply want to make sure the rich and the corporations pay their way. Many, many people are also forced into debt by low wages. It cannot be right that we are the only major developed economy to have grown while wages are lower than they were before the crash 10 years ago. And as inflation hits, Many workers are facing yet another real terms cut in their pay. And what's interesting, 
at the same time the pay of the FTSE 100 chief executives is 160 times that of the average worker. In the election campaign, Theresa May was asked why were nurses being forced to resort to food banks? To food banks? And she replied, the issue is complex. <laughs> it isn't complex, it's simple. They're simply not being paid enough. <laughs> That's why That's why we insist, we insist, the pay cap is scrapped once and for all, and not just for some, but for everybody. And we demand, and we demand decent wages for all workers. Yes, Britain does deserve a pay rise now. And we will introduce, yes, the £10 real living wage, £10 an hour, We'll introduce, we'll introduce pay ratios at the top. And I promise this, we will address the gender pay gap that still leaves women's wages trailing 14% behind men. Every, every, Every piece of legislation that we introduce will be measured against its impact on women before implementation when we go into government. I've been really pleased and proud to support a number of brave people throughout the summer who have been on picket lines campaigning for decent pay. And I've been particularly proud of those young people who have been campaigning for decent wages now those who've joined the Bakers' Union to take on the might of McDonald's. And here's one of them. And Sue. Be clear, when we go into government, we'll restore basic employment rights, we'll repeal the Trade Union Tory Act, the Trade Union Act the Tories introduced, we'll set up a new Ministry of Labour and we will restore free collective bargaining into our country again. As As wages, as wages have fallen behind, more and more families have been pushed into debt, deep into debt for many. Household debt in this country stands at a record £1.8 trillion. We've seen with payday loans some companies were, were making massive profits from people's financial difficulties. Under labour pressure, it was labour pressure, the government was forced to cap interest payments on payday loans. But more than 3 million credit card holders are trapped by their debt. They've paid more in interest charges and fees than they originally borrowed. Now, the Financial Conduct Authority has argued for action to be taken on credit card debt as on payday loans. So I'm calling upon the government to act now and apply the same rules on payday loans to credit card debt. It means that no one will ever pay more in interest than their original loan. If, if, if the Tories refuse to act, I can announce today that the next Labour government will amend the law. When we go in, you can call it the MacDonald Amendment. Sorry, I couldn't help myself on that one. <laughs> Jeremy's told me no jokes, but I couldn't resist them. Okay, so, look, some of the heaviest, we know some of the heaviest burden of debt has fallen on young people. We know that, don't we? The Tories' triple tuition fees 
and they allowed the student's loan company to hike up interest charges. Young people are now leaving university with £57,000 worth of debt. That's why, that's why we put forward in our manifesto our fully costed commitment to scrap tuition fees. And we will. And we will. I, I, I say it time and time again, education is a gift from one generation to another. It's not a commodity to be sold. With the Tories, with the connivance of the Lib Dems, have created a totally unsustainable situation. Three quarters of our students will never fully repay their loan. So it's not just bad for students, it's a bad deal for the taxpayer too. So as a result of Labour pressure, the government, even this government now, is, we here is considering maybe reducing interest rates or raising repayment thresholds. And that's what they're being forced to consider at the moment. I tell you, if they bring forward effective proposals, we'll support them. But that won't go nearly far enough. We cannot another, afford another five years of spiralling student debt. According to the Institute of Fiscal Studies and our own independent research, writing off the Tories' student debt now would cost about £10 billion by 2050. Waiting until 2022 could treble the cost of a write-off. So I'm calling upon the Chancellor to act now before the situation becomes unmanageable. It's the Tories who got young people into this mess. They should take some responsibility for getting these young people out of it. I, but it's, it's not just students and households with credit cards who are being ripped off. The scandal of the private finance initiative launched by John Major has resulted in huge long-term costs for taxpayers whilst handing out enormous profits for some companies. Profits which are coming out of the budgets of our public services. Over the next few decades, nearly 200 billion is scheduled to be paid out of public sector budgets in PFI deals. In the NHS alone, 830 million in pre-tax profits have been made over the last six years. As early as 2002, this conference expressed its regret at the use of PFI. Jeremy Corbyn has made it clear that under his leadership, Never again will this waste of taxpayers' money be used to subsidise the profits of shareholders. And you know, many of those companies and shareholders are based in offshore tax havens. The government could intervene immediately to ensure that companies in tax havens can't own shares in PFI companies and their profits aren't hidden from HMRC. So, Will, so let me give you this commitment. We'll put an end to this scandal and we'll reduce the costs to the taxpayers. How? Well, we've already pledged that there will be no new PFI deals signed by us in government, but we'll go further. And I can tell you today, it's what you've been calling for. We'll bring existing PFI contracts back in-house. We're bringing them back. We're bringing them back. We, over the last seven years, the Tories have, Tories have tried to change people's views of, of what's normal and acceptable in our society. They want us to accept, in the fifth richest country in the world, it's normal and acceptable for people to be saddled with debt, for people to have to work long in the richest country in the world, it's normal and acceptable for people to be saddled with debt. To have a pay rise for years, no matter how hard you work or how dedicated you are, for young people to have no prospect of owning their own home, 
for disabled people to be pushed to the edge by the benefit system or for carers to be struggling without support or recognition. Let's make it clear. We will never accept that this is normal or acceptable in our society. Never. We will never accept that this Yes, we'll increase GDP, we'll close the current account deficit, and we'll increase productivity. But life is not just about statistics, is it? Bobby Kennedy said 50 years ago, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry. The performance of our government, the performance of our government will be measured by the care we show to all people and the richness, the full richness of their lives. That's how we wish to be judged. We, we proved in the election, and we will now go on to prove in government, our belief that hope will always overcome fear that kindness and generosity will always overcome greedy self-interest, that the flame of solidarity in our society will never be extinguished. For years, we've campaigned and proclaimed that another world is possible. I tell you now, that world is not just, is in, not just possible, it's in sight. Let's create it now together. Solidarity. Standing ovation there for John McDonnell, the Shadow Chancellor. He spoke for just over half an hour, ending with the word solidarity to his Labour comrades. There he is, arm in arm with Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader. Well, it certainly went down well, and it was an ambitious speech. There was an awful lot of ground covered by the Shadow Chancellor. He said that Labour would rescue the country from austerity. He would also bring the government's deficit and debt under control. There were promises to scrap the pay cap for all workers and deal with the gender pay cap that he said leaves women's wages still trailing men's by 14%. There were massive cheers when he said the rail, water, energy, Royal Mail, we're taking them back. Standing ovation for that as there was for promising that the Tory government would have a political battle of its life if they tried to water down workers' rights during the Brexit negotiation. John McDonnell there being hugged on the stage for his speech. He made reference to two of the delegates congratulating them, members of the Baker's Trade Union, for taking on the might of McDonald's in recent protests that were seen around the Palace of Westminster. He also talked about PFI contracts, private finance initiatives that were launched actually by John Major, also used and promoted by the Labour governments under Tony Blair when Gordon Brown was the Chancellor, used to fund big capital expenditure projects on hospitals and schools. Um, Paul Johnson from the Institute of Fiscal Studies is here now. Talk about the scale of ambition here that John McDonnell set out for a future Labour government. Well, I think there's no getting away from the idea that this is not really about just um, getting rid of austerity or moving back to where the last Labour government was. This is a root and branch change to the way that the economy has worked since at least the 1970s. This is very big scale nationalisation, a very high minimum wage, lots of controls on the way that things happen in the uh, labour market and you heard uh, promise after promise for things that uh, they will be spending on so completely consistent with what was in the manifesto we're yes. looking at a state a government much much bigger than anything we've experienced in in a generation or two right and in terms of paying for it uh, labour always claimed that they had a fully costed manifesto you queried those costs as we talked about before but in this speech there wasn't as far as I could tell very much about how they would pay for all of this 
There was a single line in the entire speech about uh, paying for all of these uh, ambitions. And that line says, uh, we will close the tax loopholes and avoidance scams used by the mega rich and make sure the rich and giant corporations pay their way. Now, you cannot pay for the huge expansion of state activity that uh, Mr. McDonnell was describing there simply in that way. Now, let's be clear, you can pay for it. You can have the state doing significantly more than it does at the moment. You can bring things into public ownership, but you have to pay for it. You can't pay for it just through tax loopholes. This government has put through a hundred pieces of legislation, more than a hundred, to reduce tax loopholes. Has got ten billion pounds from it. There are not tens and tens and tens of billion pounds lying on the floor, ready for a new government to scoop up. Right. You say there isn't the money there, sort of low-hanging fruit or even perhaps high-hanging fruit, to pay for these big pledges. But what about? the promise to increase corporation tax or reverse the cuts and to raise taxes on higher earners, those earning over £80,000. I mean, he's going to need to get a lot of money from those people to fund what he set out today. He is, and that's, I mean, he didn't, um, he didn't actually make those uh, pledges explicit in what he said today. All he talked about was the tax loopholes, the mega rich and big corporations. But yes, in the manifesto, uh, there were big increases in corporation tax, which would raise significant sums of money, though not as much as uh, as was hoped. Uh, there were big, big tax increases on people earning over about eighty-five thousand pounds a year and again that will raise significant could raise significant money from people earning the 80 100 150 thousand pounds a year kinds of levels but we know that for the really rich the people on very big sums it's much harder to get the money from them right let's briefly talk about the private finance initiative before we talk to one of labor's front benches in the treasury team about this speech um, because he was lauded, if you like, for when he stood up and said, we aren't going to sign any more PFI deals, as they're known. We're going to look to bring them back in. What did he mean, do you think? Well, a private finance initiative is essentially uh, where the government pays a private company to uh, build a hospital or a school or actually a government department and often to run them uh, for a period. Uh, but because they're paying them year by year, they're not having a big impact on the deficit at the point at which the hospital is built. And actually, it was Gordon Brown who was the biggest user um, of this, more so than Conservative or Coalition governments. Now, uh, the problem is some of these were very badly written contracts. Some of them have been rather overpaid for. The issue then is how do you legally bring them back into the public sector, given that there are legally enforceable contracts, however badly written, between government and private sector? Are you going to expropriate them right. or are you going to pay an awful lot up front to get out of them? Stay with us, uh, Paul Johnson. Just to recap, we're chewing over John McDonald's speech to Labour conference with Paul Johnson from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. He told a crowd here, that's John McDonnell, not Paul Johnson, in Brighton a few days ago that I'm going to be Chancellor. And today we found out quite a bit more about some of the things he wants to do if his prediction comes true. It's also raised quite a few questions and happily I'm joined now by Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Peter Dowd, to answer some of them. Welcome to The Daily Politics here, live at Brighton. We were talking about the scale of ambition of a future Labour government as John McDonnell was setting out. How will increasing taxes on business, corporation tax being one example, encourage them to invest in the way John McDonnell would like them to? Well, at the moment, the reality is in this country we're not getting the investment levels uh, that we need, whether that's in the private sector or whether it's in the public sector. And the reality is you have to try and break into that circle and try and create a virtuous circle where investment leads to greater productivity, greater productivity leads to economic growth, and the economy grows more taxes. So it's trying to break into that. And it's not over a two or a three or a four year or a five year period. It's got to be over a, a sustained period, which uh, you alluded to in terms of the scale of the ambition. All right, well, let's talk about one of the announcements that John McDonnell made, which was saying that we will look to bring in PFI contracts, existing PFI contracts. So are you going to bring those in house? Well, we're going to look in more detail at that, but that's what oh. he's saying. No, no, just a minute. That's what he's saying. That there, are, there are a whole range of PFI-type contracts, from lift scheme in local hospitals, big hospitals, 
fire stations. So there are a range of them. But the answer to that is yes, we will. You're going to take them in. Yes. You're going and, to take them and over. And we believe that overall will actually save uh, money because right. we're already paying for a huge amount of that anyway. And this is a big announcement, and we just need to be clear for our viewers because Labour sources have, since that speech in the brief time, said that actually what John McDonnell meant was that you're going to review those PFI contracts. Is it a review, as you said, looking at detail, or are you definitely going to take them back in-house? Well, I think the bulk of those will come back in. As I said to you, there are a whole range of PFI schemes out there, smaller ones, large ones, in local government, in national government. And in, how much would that cost, in, do you think? In NHS. Well, we believe overall that would be self financing but at the time we will set aside uh, the resource we believe that But would how be much would it cost up front? Time. Well, I don't believe at this stage we can say how much it will cost up front. I don't believe it will overall. So you don't know yet no, how much it will cost, overall. but it's still a policy you're going but to no, do? No, no, no. Don't put words in my mouth. What I said is that we will believe it will be self-funding overall. But how can you know it's going to be self-funding if you can't tell me what the costs are be up front? Because there are significant amounts of capital being already spent out that the government are paying for in one fashion or another. Right, but would you so have to believe, compensate in the way that Paul Johnson said you might decision, have to compensate on a legal... We decision what that level will be at the time. Right, but that could run to billions and billions of pounds. Well, not, no, I don't believe it will run to billions and billions so of pounds. So how much do you think it would run well, to? Well, I'm not going to make that assessment at this particular stage, but we believe it will overall be pretty self-financing. Right, well, let's talk uh, briefly about the nationalisation projects. How much would that cost to take in rail, water, energy and Royal Mail? We're taking them back. Well, in terms of the, uh, for example, the railways, they are uh, franchises, so they will come back in as and those as those come in. And again, we will believe we will be buying an asset back. Effectively, we will be taking an asset back. And again, at that particular time, we believe that we will set aside the resource to do that at that particular right. time. Right. And is the market rate, the price, going to be set by Parliament? Is yes, that your that's, policy? Yes, that's what How will would happen. that work, then? I well, mean, they'll well, just pick a low price, won't they? Well, no, that would be an assessment of conditions at the time. You're asking me to present you what would happen, the cost of that in five or six years' time. What we'll be doing is making an assessment of that but we believe significant amounts of this are self-financing. Sure, but it's about credibility, isn't it? it and Labour wants to set that it is going to be credible and yes. put a future financial yes. statement out to the nation that is fully costed, yes. as you said in your manifesto. Paul Johnson said there was only one line in that speech about how this would be funded, about taxing the mega-rich and corporations, and that that would not cover the scale of what was set out by John McDonnell. Yes, but that is part of what we set out in Labour's manifesto at that particular point. And that the issue is that the details and more significant elements of the costing will come in due course. John has laid out our policy, what our ambition is and what we will do. And, and the financial and, detail and will and come will, later. Yes, and they will be coming later because we're setting out in great detail now what all that will be. Right. What was the most important thing for you in that speech? In a few seconds. I think it's just sending the message that a Labour government is on the way and we're going to have a fairer society and a fairer tax system as a result of it. Well, thank you very much for coming to us after that speech, Peter Dowd, Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. And thank you to you, Paul Johnson, for sitting with me here for that speech. That's it for today. Thanks to all of our guests. The one